Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, we're reading a lecture called The Riddle by Neville Goddard, delivered on November 3rd, 1969. This lecture addresses the promise and the riddle of the grandfather being the son, the son being the grandfather. He explains that this revelation is important. The Riddle by Neville Goddard. The Reverend Dr. Trussler criticized Blake for his abstruseness and said to him that he needed someone to really elucidate his ideas. Blake said to him, You ought to know that that which is grand is necessarily obscure to the weak. Then he went on to say, You also ought to know that what can be made explicit to the idiot isn't worth my care, and that the wisest of the ancients considered that what was not too explicit fittest for instruction, for it rouses the faculties to act. Then he asked the Reverend Dr. Tressler this question, Why is it that the Bible is more entertaining and instructive than any book? Is it not because it is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation and only but immediately to the understanding or reason? Now tonight, we will ask a question based upon scripture. It's a riddle, and the riddle is this. What is it that becomes his own grandson and vice versa? How is it that that which is called the divine creator who created me is my child? How can the divine creator, my father, be my child? Now, we'll take the riddle and show you how these parts are put together. It's not addressed to those to whom you must take it apart and show it in little detail. It's addressed to the human imagination. I doubt that any logical reasoning mind could unravel it. It has to be revealed. When it's revealed, you stand amazed at the statements as told in Scripture. Now here we go back to the three passages from the book of Isaiah. The seventh chapter is the first. It is translated, in some translation, a virgin, and in others, simply a young woman, a maiden. A maiden will conceive and bring forth a son. 714. Now this will be a sign, you are told, and it is that the Lord will give you a sign, and the sign is this. A maiden will conceive and bring forth a son, and will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is translated as God with us. It is better rendered God is in us, as confirmed in the New Testament. The kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 21. So it is not God with us as something on the outside, but is God in us. That is the true interpretation of the word Emmanuel, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Now we pass on to the ninth chapter, and here we read, Unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called the Everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, 6. Here, to us, to us the human personalities, and yet what we bring forth as a child, his name is Everlasting Father. I am bringing forth that which created myself. The Everlasting Father and the child are now told to be one. His name is Everlasting Father, and the Everlasting Father is the self-existent, the ever-creating being that created the entire universe and sustains it. Yet I am told I bring him forth. I bring him forth as my child. My child is my father. That is what is implied in the statement. Now we go another two chapters into the 11th, and here we find in the 11th chapter, and there shall come forth out of Jess a stem, and out of the stem will come a branch, and this branch will be the ruler of all, Isaiah 11.1. 1. Out of Jess will come a stem, and out of the stem will come a branch, and this branch will be ruler of all, 11.10. The solution of the riddle you will find in the names the word Jess means I am, the eternal everlasting name of God. And we are told, out of Jess comes the stem. Well, Jess's son is David, as told us in Scripture, 1 Samuel 17, 58. So here, we now find David. And now, out of David comes a branch, and the branch is one with his grandfather. Now, in the New Testament, the same riddle is proposed, but not answered. How can they say that the Christ is the son of David, when David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, no one answered. It's simply stated to describe in the 20th chapter of the book of Luke. You read it in the 41st and 44th verses. How is it that they say, meaning the scribes say, the wise men say that David, the Christ, is the son of David when David, in the spirit, calls him Lord. 
calls him my father. Now here, we will take these passages and put them together. Here, we find first the name of the Son is Emmanuel, which is God, is in us. That's the name of the Son. The name of the Father is David, and David is the Beloved. The name of the Grandfather is Jess, and Jess is I Am, the Everlasting God, the Everlasting Father. Here we find these three separate generations, as it were, and then we find that the Son is one with the Grandfather, and the Grandfather and the Son are one. That is what you find in Scripture. Who will unriddle the riddle? Then we come back now to David. Well then, what is David? Who is David? He's called the Beloved. I tell you now, not from any logical reasoning, because truth is revealed. It is not logically unraveled, not logically proven at all. It is revealed, and were it not revealed to me, I wouldn't know, any more than anyone in the world would know unless it was revealed to them. So I'm sharing with you the revelation. David is all the generations of humanity, but all of them fused together into a single being, and that single being is personified as one youth, an eternal being, and the beloved of the eternal father. Out of him he begets himself. The whole drama is nothing more than the reproducing of the divine imagination in the human imagination. That's all that it is. A constant reproducing of itself. For there is not a thing in the world but God. He's reproducing himself in every being in the world. But it takes something in which he reproduces himself, and that is humanity. Humanity is the mask that he wears. The sum total of all the experiences of men fused into one single whole, and that whole personified comes out as a youth, and the youth is David. So humanity in that sense is his son, but out of humanity comes God, which would be the grandson, and the grandson is one with the grandfather. You are the grandfather. This is a riddle, and only the indolent mind would fail to respond to the challenge. What is it that actually becomes its own grandson? and the grandson becomes the grandfather, and they are one. So here we find the three stages. God is begetting himself on humanity, and humanity does his will. I have found in David a man after my own heart who will do all my will, Acts 13.22. So man is completely under the control of this supreme being, and man does all his will, and he begets on man his grandson. Man becomes the son, and man's child is his grandson. But the grandson and the grandfather are one and you are both. You are what you begot, and you are the begetter. So you come out, and you are God the Father, and you look now on humanity personified as David, and David calls you Father, because what David brought forth is only himself the begetter. The grandfather and the grandson are one. You, humanity, are that on which it's begotten. But when you can see humanity gathered together into one single being and personified, it's David and David calls you father, then you are the grandfather and the grandson who are really one. I do not say that this is the easiest thing in the world for man to grasp, but I'm telling you it is true. It is a fantastic miracle that takes place. It is the riddle of riddles. So then he asks the question, why do they say that Christ is the son of David when David in the spirit calls him Lord? Matthew 22:42. So here I am bringing forth and brought forth the child. I am told that I will give you a sign, and this shall be a sign. A maiden will bring forth a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. God is in us. What came out as a child, that is a sign, is God is in us. Now we move over to the ninth chapter, and we find unto us a child is born. 9.6. Here is this wonderful child, and his name is Everlasting Father. You mean the child is Everlasting Father? Yes. So he begot, though me his own grandchild, I am his son but now he's going to raise me. I begot his grandchild, and then his grandchild stands before me. It is my son, and he is his grandfather, and I'm looking at him, and I see David. And David, which is the being out of which it came, therefore who am I? I am the grandfather, and the grandfather and the grandson are one. I'm not telling you this is the easiest thing in the world to grasp, but I thought this is the time for you to hear it. We have reached the point in time for you to hear it that the grandfather and the grandson are one. These are the three as named first out of Jess. Jess means I am, the eternal name of God the Father, the everlasting Father. Will come a stem. Well, Jess's stem is called David. All right, we'll call David humanity. And then out of David will come a branch, 
and that is called Christ. Now Jesus asked the question, what do you think of the Christ? Matthew 22:42. How can scribes say that he is the son of David when David in the spirit calls him Lord? By then he is the grandfather and as the grandfather he is the father of David. So the grandson and the grandfather are one. David is that on which he molds himself and brings out himself and then raises you, the individualized you, out of which it came to himself. So you are the grandfather and the grandson, and then humanity remains on which to mold himself throughout eternity. Humanity is simply David. If all the experiences of man could be gathered together and fused into one single whole, and that concentrated time projected into a single being, it would appear before you as an eternal youth, and you don't have to ask anyone his name. His name is David, but he represents all the experiences of humanity, but all of them fused into a single whole, and that single whole projected and personified is David. So you've gone through, or you will go through, all the experiences of humanity, and when you've gone through it, you'll bring forth the Son, your Son, and your Son is but the grandson of God, the Father, and he and his grandfather are one. You then become the grandfather, and you are God himself. The eternal divine imagining is reproducing itself in human imagining, so that the I am of man is one with the universal I am. There can't be any other. There is no other. There is nothing but God. So all the horrors that you see in the world and all the frightfulness that you experience and have experienced or may experience, it all adds up to the birth of the wonder child unto us. To us a child is born. So here we find three generations. Here we find Jess, the universal I am. And here we find the us, a human personality, to us is born we have the experience of what of this wonder child but his name bear in mind is everlasting father you mean how can i begotten of the eternal father produce the father that's what i have to do i bring forth because he can't beget anything but himself so i beget the eternal father and then having begotten the eternal father i have the experience of this glorious son david who made it possible so i became humanity that I may beget myself. Humanity remains no matter what horrors you have heard of humanity, no matter what things you have read about it. And the history of humanity is horrible, but it took all these things to produce a son, which was the grandson of the eternal father. And the grandson and the grandfather are one. The son remains humanity, and humanity condensed into a single being is David. I hope you will dwell upon it, I'm not telling you it is the easiest thing in the world for you to grasp, but I thought this is full time to tell the riddle, for there are many things to be said and time is short. But here, this is the riddle. The eternal being who is God the Father entered into the eternal structure of the world, for that's humanity. Man as you see him is part of the eternal structure of the world, and on it he is reproducing himself in this part of the eternal structure of the world. When he brings out his likeness, it's his grandson. Then the grandson said, David called me Lord, and the Lord is David's father. Therefore, the grandson, the Christ, was called the Lord by David, and therefore he's one with his grandfather, the identical image of his grandfather and one with it. Then he looks out, and David calls him Lord, so he is one with the eternal everlasting father. So it's only the search for the father that is taking place in this world, and there is nothing but God the Father. So I'm not saying that it is the easiest thing for you to hear tonight. I'm quite sure that most of us here tonight are not here for the first time, and you're fully aware of what I've been trying to say over the years. So it should not be difficult for you to simply dwell upon it and sense it until it actually is revealed to you by a wonderful mystical experience. It will be revealed to you, and you will be the eternal God, God the Father. For the universal I am and your I am are not two I am's, it's the same I am. So he's bringing forward himself by molding himself upon the part of eternity, which is the human family. And it's a very painful process to bring out his likeness, to reproduce himself, the divine imagination in the human imagination. There's no better way to do it than to put it in this manner. So these three passages in the 7th, 9th, and 11th chapters of Isaiah, and then the 20th chapter of Luke all propound the identical riddle. The riddle put into our language would be, what is it that becomes its own grandson, and how is it that the grandson is one with the grandfather? How can that which 
begot me, actually become my child, and in becoming my child, raise me to my begetter, who is God the Father. And then to look back on humanity and all the experiences of humanity fused into a single being standing before me and calling me Father. So you dwell upon it. It's not the easiest thing to grasp, but we're going to give you lots of time to challenge me tonight or ask questions. You'll find this the most stimulating and far from being practical, you will find it the most practical thing you've ever heard. Far more exciting than anything you have heard or read about today on TV, radio, or, or in the papers. For not a thing said this day by any person in the world would compare to it. All the plots and plans of men concerning bringing this war to an end and all these things is all part of a divine plan. The plan is not the wars and the peace as the world sees it, but to bring out himself. He's only begetting himself. Divine imagination is reproducing himself in the human imagination, and they are not two, they are one. They differ only in the degree of intensity. But the purpose of it all is that you will be able to wish anything and realize it. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, that you'll ask for anything and realize it. That's the purpose of the entire scheme, that you will not be a slave of anything in this world, not be afraid of anything, for you'll know you are one with the creator of the universe, and that you can ask and expect instantaneous return as far as the answer goes. That comes with the complete revelation of what I have told you tonight. Now you will not find it spelled out as I have this night to you, but you can read scripture and having heard my story over and over again, you will follow my argument. So the problem is, and the riddle is, what is it that becomes its own grandfather and vice versa? The grandson becomes its own grandfather. And then, if this is so, where is that father of the grandson and where does he fit in? His name is David. And you'll find out when you bring forth the wonder child whose name is Everlasting Father. You wake a few months later to find out that you, instead of being his son, you are the father of David. So instead of coming out of humanity as humanity's son, which you did, for it took humanity and all the horrors that God, the real father, experienced to produce his being, his likeness, and his likeness is himself. So then you awake as God, the eternal father. Humanity remains, but this time, not a multitude of faces, only one face. All the faces put together and fused into one body stands before you. And David calls you my Lord. So how then can he be David's son when David in the spirit calls him my Lord? You follow? I hope so. If you haven't followed it, I do hope that many of you have taken it down on the tape and you'll play it over and over for it is a profound truth. And I think nothing deeper in scripture will come to you for this is the story of scripture. So Blake was perfectly right. Why is the Bible more entertaining and more instructive than any book? Is it not because it is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation and only immediately to the understanding or reason? Therefore, what can be made explicit to the idiot is not worth my care. And the ancients, the wisest of the ancients, consider what was not too explicit fittest for instruction because it rouses the faculties to act. So here comes a riddle, and you got to respond to that challenge. Where on earth could it be and how could such a thing happen? How can a grandson become his own grandfather? For that is what he's telling us in these three passages of Isaiah and in the passage of Luke. You say that the Christ is the son of David, but I ask you now, how then can he be the son when in the spirit of David calls him my Lord? If he's the son of David and David's father is my Lord and David in the spirit calls him not my son, but my Lord, then he is his own grandfather? Do you get it? You dwell upon it. Maybe this night, because it's been given to you this night, something may happen. Something may explode within you to lead you to an understanding of it. But the full understanding comes when you experience it, and the whole thing unfolds within you like a wonderful unfolding flower, and there is only the eternal God unfolding in humanity. And you'll find these three generations constantly throughout Scripture. The book of Matthew, which begins our New Testament, begins with three generations. This is the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Three generations. Doesn't state anymore. 
Then it begins to project into the genealogy, the generations. But the names now, Abraham is the father of multitudes. That's all that it states. That's what the word means, father of multitudes, nothing but. Here we find David in the middle again. He is the father of Jesus Christ. He is the beloved, that human being that brought forth the image of God. The image of God is called Jesus Christ, but the image of God and God are one. So it goes back now to the grandfather. So tonight, although it may seem profoundly spiritual, I must repeat what I've said time and time again. Whatever is most profoundly spiritual will prove in time to be the most directly practical. Instead of wrestling with the problem, you dwell upon these wonderful revealed truths and the problem solves itself. Instead of going to bed and bursting a blood vessel to find out how you're going to meet this, that, and the other commitment, you go to bed dwelling upon these and the commitments are met. Your father knows what you have need of. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these will be added unto you Matthew 6 33 they will be added while you sleep things will happen in your world while you dwell upon these profound thoughts of revealed truth everything will come you sit down to work out one problem and you simply involve yourself with another and another but dwell upon revealed truth and then all these things that you need in this world your father knows you need shelter that you need food that you need clothing that you need all these things but you dwell upon his word and try to wrestle with his conundrums, these wonderful well riddles. You may not unravel them, but dwell upon them. Dwell upon what I have told you tonight, because I'm telling you what I know from experience. I did not arrive at these by any logic in the world. I'm not trained in logic. I'm not a philosopher. I simply am one in whom the word unfolded, completely unfolded. There isn't a thing else that I can think of in scripture that hasn't unfolded within me. But you're told in time, you'll be urged to tell it in good time. So you tell it at a certain moment in time and you hear it this night, you dwell upon it, that you are giving birth to Christ and Jesus Christ who will be your son because he came out of you, that is the wonderful child, is one with your father who would have to be his grandfather. He is one with your father. And as he came out of you, and he's one with his grandfather, which is your father. Finally, you awaken to find you are the everlasting father. Because now you look down upon yourself called man, which is now personified as David, and David calls you father. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by question and answers, which there are quite a few in this one. Now let us go into the silence. Question. 
In regard to what you said about the grandfather and the grandson, does this equate with Mary conceiving of the invisible father and bringing forth a son, and his man then Mary? Neville says, yes. I am Mary, and birth to God must give, if I am blessedness for now and evermore should live. Scheffler. Think of humanity as feminine. The soul of man, think upon it as the bride of the Lord. My maker is my husband, as told us in Isaiah 54, 5. Then he will cleave to me, leaving all and become one with me. He leaves all and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh, so I am Mary. I said that one night here, oh, about two years ago, and one took issue with me, and he's never returned. Perfectly all right. He will wake one day, and he will know that he is Mary, and he has to bring forth the Christ child, but you're told in the seventh chapter of Isaiah, and the Lord will give you a sign, 714. A woman translated a maiden, a virgin, but the word simply means a young woman, whether she is a virgin or not, who in the world is a virgin if they have ever had a mental affair with the opposite. Who in the world is a virgin when they are told in scripture it's all psychological? You are told that you should never lust after another, but anyone who lusts after another has already committed the act in his heart with her. Matthew 5.27 Therefore, it is a psychological motion. If I want, but restrain the impulse, impulse was the act. So you can call it a virgin or a young woman, but I am Mary, and birth to God must give, if I in blessedness for now and evermore would live. And so I brought forth the child, and only Mary brings forth the child, so I am Mary. Mary is the bride of the Holy Spirit, who brought forth the child, and the child and the Holy Spirit are one. The child, my son, and his grandfather are one. But by then, when I bring forth the son, he has finished his work in me and the cleavage with me, on me, has been complete, and we aren't two now, we are one. So the three become one, and yet humanity remains that upon which I can continue to mold myself. It's the divine imagination reproducing itself upon humanity, and in the end, you will actually come out as God the Everlasting Father. Question is there in scripture passages that bear witness to your experience of seeing David that spells out he is the symbol of humanity? Neville says, not in the sense that I have explained it, but it is, I have found David, and he has cried unto me, Thou art my father, in the 89th Psalm, 8926. There are certain words in scripture that are not translated. If you translate them, go to the concordance and look them up. You'll find one word used only once in the 16th chapter of the 1 Corinthians, and it is left just as it is. Some take the word before it, which is anathema, which translated means a curse, and join it to the word but then you think that the original manuscript had no punctuation marks. In fact, they had no vowels. They were all consonants and not punctuated, no sentences, no paragraphs, no chapters. That was done centuries later. So, the King James Version takes the word and puts a period after these two and leaves the word anathema and the word maranatha, which simply means in the Revised Standard Version, our Lord has come. It has come. It actually has happened. This whole thing has happened. That's how he ends his first letter to the Corinthians. Just about the verse before the benediction comes this word untranslated in the King James Version, but translated in the Revised Standard Version. You shouldn't join it to anathema, for if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, anathema means be ye cursed, because you will be by not believing in this eternal story of salvation. But then the next word should be something entirely different, beginning the sentence which means our Lord has come. It has actually happened. That which was promised or foreseen throughout the centuries has finally happened. Now some will translate it instead of saying our Lord has come, they will translate it like the one in the end of Revelation, come Lord Jesus, meaning it has not yet, but please we're hopeful, it's the great hope of man. But I know from my own experience, it has come. And it's continuing to come in the lives of humanity because it can't fail. Everyone is simply being worked on where God the Father, the Everlasting Father, is begetting himself in man. When he begets himself, he's completed the work. When it comes out, it is the Christ child, and what is begotten is one with the begetter. And that out of which is, was begotten was his bride. Then she awakes without any change of identity, and she is God the Father. Then humanity stands before her, fused together into a single being, 
and that single being is a youth, the eternal youth called David. It's all there but not spelled out. As Blake said, if it could be made explicit to the idiot, then it isn't worth my care. Then he said the wisest of the ancients consider what it was not too explicit fittest for instruction because it rouses the faculties to act. But if you take it just as a little story, a story that is a secular story, well then anyone can write scripture. But it isn't that. The whole thing is a hidden book that is completely contained in man, and then suddenly it comes to the surface. Man having gone through hell, luckily, our infinite Father, who we are destined to awaken as, is merciful and has hidden from us the memory of the horrors through which we have passed. You have only glimpses of the horrors. Sometimes someone threatens a certain thing and then a faint memory returns. It wasn't a threat in the past. It was a fact. It actually happened to you. I know when I was a boy in Barbados and he said it quite without taking thought. He was a fisherman, a black fisherman and little boys in Barbados. There's no reason for bathing suits or things of that sort. And I came out of the water in the nude running towards the other part of the beach where I left my little clothes with a rock on them. He didn't mean it, he never would for one moment have intended what he said, but suddenly a flash returned that that same event happened to me in the dim past. He said to me, come here, I'm going to castrate you. But memory fades. I recalled it vividly at that moment and I was scared to death at what he said. But that was an experience of the past that my father, in whom I have awakened as, in his infinite mercy, he hid that memory picture from me until that one little incident revived it. So everything in the world has significance. Everything has significance. And he was perfectly innocent of what he said. He was simply kidding in his own way with a little white boy. I came out of the water and here was this Negro taking care of his nets. He was a fisherman and getting all the knots out, getting it ready to dry before he could go off to sea the next day to catch fish. Undoubtedly, if I asked him at any time for a fish, he would throw me a half dozen of them. They were all lovely, wonderful men, so he didn't intend to hurt me, but he revived a memory. So the whole thing comes back, and in the end, the whole thing comes back, and you are God the Father who began the whole thing. For in the end, there can be nothing but God the Father. Question, this is my first visit. How do you view the devil symbolically? I've never heard your views. Neville says, well, the devil is everything that God is not, and God is the only reality, so the devil is not. Question, but in your line of thinking, if we are evolving towards being awakened to the realization that we are in fact God? Neville says, well, put it this way, God is affirmative. We're told all the promises of God find their yes in him, that's affirmation. Then negation would be the devil. When something seems impossible, that is the devil. If I say all things are possible to God, but something may not be, well then, that is the devil. So here comes now negation in my world. So anything that negates yourself? Neville says, yes, that is the devil, that's Satan. Well, my dears, it's almost time and I do hope that you listened attentively tonight because you really will find something so altogether wonderful when you dwell upon it. What you're destined to awaken to. You are destined to awaken to the fact that you are the everlasting God who created the whole vast universe, brought into being, and you sustain it. Good night. And this concludes The Riddle by Neville Goddard. I've seen this lecture and thought about reading it many times, as sometimes I like the lectures on imagination more than the lectures on the promise. He just talks about the promise repeatedly, repeatedly as he moved into later life. And we've talked about it many times. Sometimes it seems poignant, sometimes it seems repetitive. But I was really drawn to this explanation at the beginning the idea that the ancients, they never made anything explicit. They put their instructions through symbolism and through riddles. And so there is a riddle in the Bible. I understand what he's getting at. I do understand the idea that he had a vision. It was of David and David represented humanity. I'm not completely convinced but it's not important that this vision is the same vision that we will all have i believe that it's a vision that he had because he was such an avid bible reader but i'm also interested in the question and answer section when he mentions having a memory of the past we've discussed neville's understanding of 
the afterlife, the idea of the wheel of recurrence in which you essentially live the same life over and over and over again. And he was starting to get memories of this past experiences. And he didn't say that it was reincarnation. Once you die, you regenerate as a 20 year old, not knowing or remembering that you've just regenerated, you have past memories and then you move on. And each time that you die, you go back and experience things in a time frame that is meant for you. And so Neville started having memories of experiences that he had had in other loops that he had been through. He knew about his death. He knew about the things that he was going through. And that's why Neville fascinates me because he had this perspective. Neville seems to be saying here that it's important that us understanding this concept is important, that it awakens something in our imagination as the Bible is speaking to our imagination. And oftentimes when I read a lecture of Neville's that seems boring or doesn't make a lot of sense, later on I get little bits and pieces from it. It is speaking to my imagination a portion of my imagination that understands more than I do in my conscious state. And I'd love to get your comment on that. If you feel like a greater understanding from hearing these lectures comes through your imagination, that it's speaking to some part of you, that it's answering some unknown riddle that has been asked that you're not aware of. I'd love to get your perspective. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.